There's always something that needs a little fixing on Far Point Farms. Hey guys, it's Eric, owner of Far Point Farms here in the Miles, North Carolina. It's time to do the 10K service on my 2018 Mitsubishi Mirage. This is going to be the same though for all Mirages from 2014 to 2022 probably. The, uh, the 1.3 liter or 1 liter uh, three-cylinder engine is the same across the board. If it's a CVT at the 20,000 mile oil change or service, that'll be a little different than a manual transmission. This being the CVT, I'm going to be replacing the fluid and uh, the little internal and external filters on it. But the rest of this is the same. Now, Mitsubishi recommends 7,500 mile oil changes. I, as a mechanic for over 30 years, am going to tell you that's probably a bit too long for any car. So go with a 5,000 mile oil change, and that's what I've done. When I bought the car, I put 500 miles on it. I did an oil change to get out any casting or debris or anything that got caught up in there at the factory. At 5,000 miles, I did an oil change. I didn't film it. This is just the initial oil change. And at 10,000, I'm going to do that. I've got an oil change. I've got uh, three and a half quarts or 3.7 quarts, I think it is, of full synthetic 0W20 oil. I've got a genuine Mitsubishi oil filter and a genuine Mitsubishi drain plug gasket. I've also got some Berryman's B12 Chem Tool. This is the first time I'm going to use any chemicals on this and a little bit of Marvel Mystery Oil. 10,000 miles, I figure carbon stuff is now just starting to form on some of this stuff. So we'll go ahead and run some fuel cleaner through it. Go ahead and start using Marvel Mystery Oil during every one of these oil changes. And I, I kind of recommend you do the same with your car. It's inexpensive and it's kind of a little bit of an insurance policy for it. Also going to be doing the stuff you do during a 5,000 mile service. I'm going to check the air filter, the cabin filter. I'm going to check tire pressures. I'm going to rotate the tires. I'm going to check the brakes and I'll show you all that stuff. Some of this video I'm going to speed up to lightning speed. There is another camera over here and I will use a handheld camera at times to also show you, you know, the close-ups of what I'm doing. But it's just a matter of topping off fluids, checking fluids, checking pressures, stuff like that. Stuff you should do on every car. Now, I do have an automotive lift that I'm going to be doing this work on, so it's going to look a little easier than maybe trying to do it in the yard. But there is no reason that if you own one of these cars that you can't do the same job with far less than $100 worth of tools. Most places charge $40 to do an oil change. The dealership's charging $79. So for the cost of two oil changes, you can own all this equipment and do this yourself, right? Anyway, enough talk. Let's get this thing going. I'm going to go ahead and pop the hood here. I've already got the gas cap open. And I'm going to go ahead and open this thing up here. And I'm looking, I'm looking at my washer fluid. Washer fluid's a little bit low. I've got just a little bit of washer fluid left. So I'll go ahead and top that off right here. Perfect. And it's not a bad idea to go ahead and check how much the oil level has changed in those 5,000 miles. I actually check mine every month or so, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the dipstick out now and take a look and see if this engine is burning. The Mirage engine is not one of the engines that's known to burn oil. But anything is possible. Perfect. We're still exactly at the full line. So no burning of oil. The oil looks, you know, a dark amber, which is good. Um, air filter. Air filter sits right up here. I'm going to go ahead and pull that box loose, move this out of the way, and you can peel this filter right off. And you can take a look at it. I'll bring it up close here so you can see that. Nice and clean, right? We're still good. If for some reason, what if a... A critter had crawled in through the air box and decided to make a nest in there. That'd be something I could go ahead and order and replace. The cabin filter's inside the car. I'll do that when I get it back on the ground. Go ahead and reinstall that little filter. Slide that back into place. Snap and snaps. And that's good to go. I am going to test my battery. Should be A-OK, -okay, but just want to be sure that I don't get any surprises with winter coming up. Got this really nice Ancel battery tester here. And I'm going to go ahead and use that. In fact, I'm going to bring the camera in closer here so you all can see the work I'm doing on the engine. Yeah, that's a whole lot better. Okay, so we've got the uh, battery tester we're going to hook up here. And pop that up. We're looking for corrosion and stuff. Thankfully, I don't see anything coming up here. That's nice. Got my Ansel battery tester. This is just a real quick test. I'm not doing a full system test. Okay, so it's telling me to turn on the lights because it got a surface charge. I did have it running to warm the engine up. You should definitely warm your engine up if you're going to do an oil change. Good. 84% charge is what it's saying on there if you can't see that. So not bad at all. That's it. I'll put that away. Close my hood down here. Close this. What else am I looking at? How about uh, looking at um, looking to see if the uh, brake fluid is abnormally low. 
It's not, in fact, it's still real close to the full line. Look at that, my coolant here. It's also right at the full line. And this being a CVT, I could pull up the CVT and just take a quick sniff of that if I want to. Let me see. Yeah. I'm smelling it, I'm looking at it, it's perfectly clean still and uh, smells right. It's kind of be kind of a greenish color. So regular automatic transmission fluid being more of a red color, just so you know. And that's it, right? I can also check my belt tension. This is uh, a little bit unique in the sense that it does have a manually tensioned belt. So I'm just checking for deflection on the belt. And, uh, and I mean, you, you know, if you're hearing squealing or chattering or something, that'd be something you'd want to look at. But in this case, it feels tight and it hasn't been giving me any trouble. So it feels like it should be okay. All right, I'm gonna move the camera back set the posts and I'm going to lift this car up in the air to make the rest of this a little easier. Right, got my lift post set here. I'm going to go ahead and pull my dipstick out just a little bit to help with the drain of the oil. And I'm ready to go up. Let's go ahead and lift this thing. That'll work. Now look, there's some stuff I'm probably not going to show on film, but it's stuff that if you were to take it to the dealership and they were actually going to do their job correctly, and that's a big if, there's things that you might want to do. Get a little graphite, spray the locks, spray the hinges. So I'd go through, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to go through here with some silicone spray and spray all my hinges here. I'm going to go all the way around and do that. I'm also looking for damage, unseen damage, things that might be a problem here with the car that I just haven't noticed up until now. I'm going to check my wiper blades again. I drive this car every day, it's my own personal car, so I know if it needs that or not, but if you took it to a dealership and they were doing their job right or a good high quality independent, these are the things they're going to be checking on your car. I'd roll through the lights and uh, I've already done that, I did that last night actually, so that's why I didn't do that, but yeah, I'd check all the blinkers, the high beams, the low beams, that kind of stuff. Alright, I'm going to go up, I'm going to check tire pressures, pull off the hubcaps and rotate the tires. When we have the tires off, we'll be inspecting the brakes, so we'll get a good look at that. Alright, once I've got the car up in the air, I'm going to check the tire depth, right? So this car has 10,000 miles on it. I did rotate the tires at 5,000 miles, so shouldn't be any unusual wear, but you do want to check this stuff. I'm looking for my wear pattern. Is the tire wearing evenly across the band of tread, or is it really showing wear on one side or the other? And that's an indication that the alignment has gotten out of whack. I don't know if I can rotate the tires. Yeah, I can't pull them out here so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. I'll bring the camera in closer here and I'll show you what I'm doing. Okay. So here you can see my tread, right? So I'm looking at the tread on this thing and I want to see, hey, is the inside worn out? Is the outside worn out? Is the center worn out? A center being worn out would indicate that you're running over inflated. The edges being worn out evenly on both edges, that would indicate you're running it with too little pressure in it. And if you have bad edge wear on either side, well, that indicates an alignment issue. Any of those things, you probably want to take this thing into town and get somebody with an alignment machine to check it out for you. These, they look evenly worn. They do definitely have some wear on them. Uh, 10,000 miles worth, in fact, right? Well, I want to see if they're wearing evenly in the front and the rear. I'm going to rotate them anyway, but using something like this, and this is literally like $2 worth of fine machinery, this is called a tread depth gauge. And I'm going to take that tread depth gauge, and I'm going to stick the pin here, which you can see up close. See that? In between the treads. I'm going to push down on that, and then I'm going to look at that. I'm going to be able to read what the... Uh, millimeters or in this case 30 seconds are and it's 630 seconds right so now i'm going to go around to the other four tires and measure those if i have a drastic difference that also could be an indication of maybe a dragging brake or something like that but oftentimes it's just usually customers that don't rotate their tires on a regular basis that causes that kind of issue so give me a second i'll complete that check okay so as i expected um, no unusual wear on the tires which is a good thing this car and any car equipped, I think after, what is it, 2005, is it? Has a tire pressure monitoring system on it. has a light that comes on and lets you know when the tires get low. low. There's actually a sensor behind this really cool fuzzy dice cap that I have here. And they're kind of expensive when they go bad, but they tell us when the pressure drops below, say, 31 pounds, I think it is, on this car. Anyway, I'm still going to go around and check to see, because if I have a major variation between the four tires, it may indicate that I have picked up a nail or something like that and that would require me to take a little bit of a closer look at the tire. And I'm just going to go ahead and set these all to what the factory specs are. I think it's 34 point something on this car. I'll verify that. I'll fill up all four tires, and we're ready to pull the hubcaps and swap them. We're going to swap them front to back on this car. All right. 
Got all the tires aired up and I have taken off the hubcaps. This time to remove the lug nuts and rotate the tires. Now I like to balance the tires in the rear that are now going to be going to the front. So I'm going to loosen all four sets of tires up. I'm going to drop the fronts and the rears. I'm going to put the rears back on there. The ones that are going on the front, I'm going to take them over to my little bubble balancer and just verify that none of the uh, balances. You know, sometimes they'll throw weight. Sometimes you might hit a huge pothole, something like that, and get the tire out of balance. So it's a good time to check it. Now, most of the time at dealerships, they're not going to balance your tires unless they do that as an extra charge. So balancing tires. When you buy a set of tires, they mount and balance. But if you want to have your tires balanced, usually it's $20 to $40 extra fee. I'm doing it here at the shop, and I do do it for my customers as a courtesy because it helps uh, with comebacks. So if a car leaves and I haven't balanced them and I put tires that are out of balance back on the front, that customer goes down the road, starts noticing steering wheel shake, then they're going to come back and they're going to think that something's wrong with their car. And it is, but it's not something we would normally have checked. So there you go. There's a little tip for you. Uh, if you ever have a steering wheel vibration at a certain speed range, say 35 to 45 or 55 to 65, chances are what you have is a tire imbalance and you should see somebody like me to fix it. Now I've talked about this tool uh, exclusively in another video. This is a Harbor Freight bubble balancer. This is a static balancing machine. Most, most modern uh, shops will now use a dynamic balancer. And there are those who feel like that does a better job of balancing, although I have never really noticed a difference in my own life. I suppose if you drove a high performance uh, vehicle at a high rate of speed, you might notice that there's some difference there. But this is fairly easy to set up. This can be had for about 40 bucks uh, at, at Harbor Freight. It's a bubble balancer, and it literally means there's a bubble here. Here's a picture of it up close right now. And that bubble there tells us the, the, the balance of this thing. By laying the tire, right in the center of this thing. If it leans one side or the other, we know that we have an imbalance. And <clears throat> if you can see here, it might be difficult for you. These are hammer-on weights. This is steel wheels, so it takes regular hammer weights on both sides. And it appears that it does have an imbalance right here in this spot, at least it did from the factory. So I'm gonna put that on. All we're doing, I'm not gonna pull these off. All I'm doing with this job here is verifying that nothing has really changed all that drastically. Now, if this thing leans really heavily to one side or the other, then I know that it's time to start pulling off weights and maybe readdressing the situation. But I'll go ahead and lift this tire up on here. I'm going to lay this gently down on here to where it centers on the cone. And we're going to let it balance itself out as far as wobbling around here. And then I'm going to look down in here. And again, I'm looking at it to see has this thing moved where the ball, the little bubble, has moved off to one side or the other. Guess what? It hasn't. <laughs> and I really didn't expect that. But again, if you see a big dent in the tire when you're doing your inspection in the rim here, then that's definitely an indication. This is just something I do for customers, and, and most good shops will do this for customers because they're just trying to uh, keep a customer happy and avoid a comeback. So it's kind of a win-win. So let's go ahead and remount this one. Okay, so what kind of stuff are we looking for when we take off the wheels? Before I put the wheels back on this car, I want to take a look. When it comes to our front on a front wheel drive or all wheel drive car, there's a lot of stuff going on. We got CV joints, we have drive shafts, we have all kinds of stuff. We have steering rack boots, ball joints, tie rod ends. I mean, the names just go on and on. And I don't want to confuse you or throw you off any of this stuff. But there are some things that you're going to be looking for if you want to know if you've got problems. Obviously, a car like this with such low mileage is likely not to have any problems but likely doesn't mean impossible so it is certainly important that we still check this stuff struts this is our strut assembly and i'm looking for leaks you know i can take my hand and wipe it down here and look at the oh, it's nice and dry right now if i pulled this away from right around here and it's full of like a dirty grease or dirty oil that's an indication that the seals on the strut here are failing and that's something we would want to address and i'm looking at my brake hoses you can see the hose here kind of wraps around and goes to the brake caliper Cracks, bulging, things like that would definitely be a big red flag. Calipers, I'm looking at brake pad thickness in this case. About five millimeter on this side and about six millimeter on that side. Not unusual and nothing to worry about. Two millimeter, that's about what we start thinking about maybe replacing. Rotors, are we showing big grooves? Are we showing blue spots? That's an indication either something has gotten trapped in there and is getting carved up. Blue spots, overheated, warp rotors, that kind of thing. As far as the suspension, I'm also going to take a look at the steering by wiggling this back and forth. Do I have any play, any movement? In this case, the answer is no. If I did, I'd be looking at the ball joint that sits down here or the tie rod end right here. Those 
get play in them, the inner tie rod can as well, and that can lead to issues. And these are the kind of issues that get people killed. So when we have any play in that, that's when we start recommending replacing parts. But lastly, on this car, there is a front sway bar. I'm looking at the bushings. These are just simple rubber bushings. There's no ball joints involved in that or any kind of joint at all, really. And so I'm just checking to see that they're still there, that none of that rubber has failed. Everything looks lovely. So that's it. That's as simple as it is. After I'm done balancing my tires, I will replace, I'll just put it right back on. Let's take a look at the rear suspension. At the rear of the car, the suspension is a little different. The brakes are a little different. So what we look at is a little different. Less going on here. This is a solid beam axle. This has a spring and shock set up like so. The shock part, I'm still looking. I'm wiping that down. I'm looking for that grease, that grime, something that indicates that there's an issue here. When it comes to the rest though, we have hard brake lines going to a brake drum setup on this, brake cable here for our emergency brake. Not a lot to look at. Now at 10,000 miles, I'm not bothering to take off this brake drum to take a look at the brakes. In fact, there aren't a lot of shops out there that do take apart brake drums just for inspections unless we have a customer complaint or unless the mileage in our head says, hmm, might be time for brake shoes. That being said, if you had a customer that was complaining of a grinding sound or that their e-brake wasn't holding well, that might be an opportunity for you to go ahead and take this thing apart, clean it, readjust everything, put it back together again. But at 10,000 miles, unless something had gone wrong, there's no reason why these should be bad. Usually, I don't start worrying about rear brake shoes on a vehicle until, say, 80,000 miles. And a lot of times, they'll go 150,000 with still the original brake shoes on there. So, something to be aware of. But... We've looked it over, it's time to put the wheels back on and get to the point, right? We wanna to get to that oil change. So let's go ahead and finish it up and we'll stick this camera up underneath and see if we can take a look at that oil filter and oil drain plug and get this party going, right? So when it comes time to tightening these lug nuts back down, you definitely don't wanna just hammer down with an impact gun or just tighten it until it's tight enough with a hand wrench. You wanna use something called a torque stick or a torque wrench or a combination of both, which is what I'm gonna be using here. I've shown you in the picture, here's the one right here, I've looked up the specs on this car. 80 foot-pounds is what it calls for. This is a torque limiting stick here with a 21 already on the end and it is rated for 80 foot-pounds. So I'm going to go ahead in a star pattern, tighten up my wheels. Not going to put the hubcaps back on. When we get it back down the ground, I'm going to get a manual clicker type torque wrench and I'm going to torque all those wheels down to 80 foot-pounds just to verify that I've got it tight enough. All right, we finally up underneath the car. And what are we looking at under here? Well, let me get a little bit around here. We're looking at the inside of these boots here. There's CV axles here. We want to check those boots. We're looking at the steering rack boots and we're looking for leaks. Do you see any leaks on this car? This car is particularly well maintained because it's maintained by a mechanic and that's a good thing. This little shield right here hides the starter. I do like the fact the starter is really easy to get to on this. Here's our transmission pan. Thank you, Mitsubishi, for actually installing a drain plug on that. I appreciate that. And our filter, well, it's hidden up here somewhere. I'll show you that as best as I can here in a moment. But this is our drain plug here. And I'm going to take some still pictures of underneath the car, pointing to some of this stuff as I go. But this is our drain plug, and we are going to drain this oil out, let it drain, and I'm going to let that go. And I'm going to look at some other stuff. I'm just looking at the exhaust. I'm looking anything that I may have missed pretty much while I had the car uh, at chest level, at eye level. And there's not a whole lot on this car that I would have missed, but just to double check, we haven't seen some major leak or some underside damage that uh, we just didn't catch. Once we've done that, it's time to break this loose. And uh, again, this is a 17 millimeter. Snap that loose like so. Grab a rag. Actually, I'm gonna take a picture here. While the oil is draining, I wanna look, I wanna smell. I wanna look at it, I wanna smell. If it smells burnt, that's an indication that the oil might have been there too long or that the car is running at a higher temperature than it should. But as long as everything looks pretty, and right now everything does look pretty, that's a great sign. And while that continues to drain, I am going to replace the drain plug gasket. Here's the drain plug. That chrome thing right there, that is the drain plug gasket. They are a crush gasket, crush o-ring, and so it takes a little bit of effort to get that off of there. I'll take it over to the table. Get a screwdriver on there and pop that loose. It tends to stick a little bit. Put my new one on there. So by the time I get back, that'll be done draining and I'll be ready to put this back together. All right, now this is kind of going to be hard for you to see, but you see how that looks like a flat washer? A lot of guys would mistake that for a flat washer, but it's actually not. It's actually this. It's a little fatter when it goes on that first time. It is this 
double layered hollow really kind of interesting Mitsubishi and Nissan tend to use these I do try to replace these on customer cars every time I get it in there that being said a lot of times we just don't have it in stock I mean there's so many different styles out there so as long as it's somewhat reusable it's not a terrible terrible thing to do not to reuse it but if possible I do try to reuse I try to replace them anyway all right, you can see it's down to a drip here. If you have done this correctly, let me put my face and camera here. If you have warmed up your car, then this should drain out pretty much all the way. You should come down to where it's just a, an occasional drip. If the car is really cold or the weather outside is really cold, you may not. It may just continue to kind of drizzle out forever. But it is acceptable at this point to go ahead and reinstall the uh, drain plug. Okay, I'll get it finger tight. I'm gonna wipe that little oil that was sitting there off. Grab my wrench, tighten it down. Now look, there is a torque spec for your drain plug, but uh, years of experience have given me the ability to just kind of do what I just did there. And uh, this is something that time just gives you an idea of how tight things are supposed to be. We are ready to move on to the part that I really can't show you very well. Up in this hole right here is the oil filter and it needs to be replaced. It's a black filter so it doesn't stick out very well in the pictures. I am going to take two or three pictures of that. Hopefully one of them shows out good enough that I can share it with you. But we're going to unscrew that, drop it into the pan, and we're going to be looking for a few things before we put the new filter back on. This does tend to make a little bit of a mess. Get your catch pan in the right spot, and when you unscrew it, there it goes, it's starting to come out. I'll let that drain for a moment or two. Well, as I was saying, it's a bit of a design flaw. You can't really see it very well, but that same shield that protects the starter also happens to catch oil in there. So you can see it's dripping out the back and coming down the front. It's just an issue that they came across. Not all car manufacturers think out all these issues when they sell a car, when they design a car. My personal opinion is that engineers should have to work at least two years in the industry as a mechanic before they are allowed to even come close to helping design a car because most of them have no idea what it's like to actually work on a car and that makes them very ineffective at properly designing automobiles. And that's the end of my rant. Let's go ahead and unscrew this the rest of the way and we will pull it off and I'm going to show you the one last thing I'm looking for before I install my new filter. That is drain that for a second that's this right here hopefully you can see this uh, yeah, hopefully you can that's the o-ring that goes around that see it right there occasionally you'll have a filter that's screwed on too tightly or is not properly lubricated before reinstallation and that sticks to the housing that sticks to the flange where the new filter goes on if you do end up forgetting this part and double don't double check it you end up with what's called a double gasket Double gasket is definitely not something you want to have and it'll cause a massive loss of oil pressure at the most inopportune time. It'll destroy your engine. So this is uh, this costs people their jobs and it costs people their cars. So make sure you check the gasket either. On some cars you can look right up there at the flange. On this one it's pretty well hidden. I can't really see it so I'm going to have to rely on the fact that I see that the gasket is on this. Now I'm going to wipe this down a little bit. Clean this up. If I don't, if I were a customer I took this car directly home after having it worked on and parked it in my driveway. I might come back out and think that something had gone horribly wrong because there'd be a puddle in my driveway. So a lot of times these little catch pans, these little hidden spots that the engineers never even consider being a problem, cause issues for customers and for technicians. And some of this is just not going to be able to be, uh, you know, soaked up. But I am sticking a rag up in there, just wiping all this down pretty well. Okay. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and grab our other filter. Here's our new filter. Now look, if you get an aftermarket filter, it's probably not gonna be lubricated. The ones from Mitsubishi have a light coating of grease on that O-ring. If they don't, go ahead and put a little on there. I'm also gonna pour just a little bit of oil in here so that when I start this car, it doesn't start completely dry. I'm going to do that outside of camera view, unfortunately, but just a little bit. I'm not going to fill the thing all the way up because it'll end up just spilling all over the place, but I want to get some in there so that it's not a 100% dry start. Okay, and I'm going to slide this thing back up in there by touch and screw it back on. 
Okay. Once that's on there nice and tight, take one last moment to wipe off any residual oil that may have been around the drain. Catch anything that may have dripped down. Right. Roll my cart out of the way here, my little oil pan. And I'm gonna clean up any mess I may have made. And that's it. Ready to come back down and finish up this job. All right, we're getting down to it now. Back on the ground, I'm gonna go ahead and remove my old cap. Place that there. I'm gonna grab a funnel. Yeah, not knowing what might have been in that funnel before, I'm gonna go ahead and wipe that out real good. Get the cobwebs if there's any built up there. Place my funnel in here, sort of. <laughs> I'm gonna get my Marvel Mr. Oil. Add a little bit to it, just a little bit now. This car calls for 3.2 quarts, and we've already put maybe one tenth of a quart into the drain plug, so I'm just gonna put a little bit in here as well. Let's and then we're going to put an oil in. Three quarts first. We'll put that one tenth of a quart in last. I'll call it a day. I am using full synthetic. I do highly recommend you use full synthetic on all modern automobiles. The cost of synthetic oil has gone down so much, it is just silly not to use it, especially if you're doing your oil changes on your own here at the house. And uh, I've got a car quest, I think, this go around, but usually I use Supertech, Walmart's brand. Stuff works great, it's made at the same plant. As pens oil and uh, it's high quality stuff you can check out other youtubers who have done independent tests on it it actually does really well on those independent tests no reason not to use this stuff all right well that is settling I'm gonna now go over to the gas tank and do the same thing I've got a can of Berryman's B12 and I got a little bit of Marble on Mr. Oil maybe add to the tank as well since the Marvel Mr. Oil is a little bit heavier I usually put that in first and then use the Berryman B12 to wash it out. Again, you're only going to put one notch of this into either one of those, so that's what I'm going to do. All right. And then the Berryman's, I'm going to add the whole bottle. This car has about three quarters of a tank. I want to head back into town. Oops. When I head back into town, I will, uh, there we go. I'll fill it up. That'll help agitate that and uh, I'll get the full tank's worth of, of goods out of that. That Berryman stuff's pretty strong. I think I made a video of it several years back. Maybe I'll make a, another video on it at some point, but it's very inexpensive. It's about half the cost of sea foam, and it works. The stuff just works. Real strong, though. I bought a case of this about three years ago, maybe two years ago, right around the time they were having their 100-year anniversary. I think it was 2018. Bought a whole case of it. Still have a few bottles left. And occasionally I'll sell a bottle to a customer or recommend it if somebody's got a car that has more than 60,000 miles on it. That B12 there. Let's see, when was the 100 year anniversary? It had to be about 2018, I think. Made in the USA. Just letting that drain. Take that out of there. We'll pop this back in. Oil should be drained. We're ready to start this car up. Double check the oil level and then Tighten down our wheels, put our hubcaps back on, and we're done. All right, back up here at the front, we've got the dipstick pushed back down, oil caps back on. We're going to start the car. We're running about 15, 20 seconds. Take a look underneath, make sure that I don't have any kind of catastrophic failure going on. Again, a blown out oil seal, something with the oil filter just being a defective filter. It happens. I'm going to do that. I'm going to shut it off. I'm going to let another 20 seconds go by. I'm going to pull out the dipstick and double check my oil level. And we're ready to just finish the tightening torque on the wheels, put the hubcaps back on, and we're gone. All right, let's check that oil level. It'd be hard to see, but about perfect. Just about perfect. That's it. I'm ready to close the hood on this one. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Okay, just time to wrap things up and let me just point this out. This is a torque wrench, digital. You can get these digital, you can get a bar wrench, you can get a clicker wrench. The most common is clicker. This one here is a Craftsman that I've literally had since I got started in this career. 
but uh, you can get these at Harbor Freight for $9.99 on sale. And I recommend you do that if you decide to do brake work, tire work, stuff like that at your house. Because getting these torque spec wrong may not get you killed, but it may. I've set this to 80 foot-pounds. I'm just going to go ahead and verify all the way around that all these are set to the right amount of foot-pounds. And then I'm going to put my hubcaps on, and that is it, my friends. The operation of a torque wrench like this is simple. You set the measurement and you move it down until it clicks. Right? No big deal. Move to the rears, do the other side, and we're out of here. And that's it. <laughs> so you have just watched what a proper service on a Mitsubishi Mirage should look like. This is the same for every car that is in your driveway, in your apartment parking lot, or out parked in the street in front of wherever it is you may live. This is work that you can do. When you take it to a professional like myself, I'm happy to do this kind of work, and I do do quality work, or at least I attempt to. I can't say that that's true for every single shop you're going to take your car to, which is why, again, I'm going to stress that it's probably not a bad idea for you to invest in the tools to do these jobs yourself, because this is your investment. This isn't my investment. And by keeping up with your own car, you'll not only learn how to work on cars, you're also going to save a ton of money, and you're going to have the satisfaction knowing that the job was done right the first time. I'm Eric, the owner of Farpoint Farms Repairs and Restorations. I very rarely film videos of repairs and restorations here, mostly due to customer privacy concerns. But anytime I'm working on my own stuff, I'm happy to share the skills and knowledge that I have accumulated over these many, many years with you. Until next time, my friends, take care.